Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, thanks for having us here. Um, Ashish and I decided to do this kind of as a partnership, but uh, I'm mostly just going to do a little bit of the intro and then leave like the technical wizardry to him mostly. Um, this started, we, we had a, uh, we've done a, a presentation called Ponage and Detection at the Educause Security Professionals Conference, which is one of the higher ed security conferences for a few years. And in that, we usually go through a bunch of incidents that have happened over the year and talk about kind of how we detect them and what we missed and lessons learned, that sort of thing. Um, and when we were talking to Robin about um, Brocon this year, and he was saying, you know, we're looking for different ways to present Bro and in different kind of formats and stuff. And we thought, well, this is perfect if we can talk about some of the incidents that we catch with Bro in kind of our day to day operational security role. That might be really cool. So it, it's certainly not going to be like the presentation. I, I know a few of you saw our, our ponage and detection talk at Educause. It's not like that, actually. We're, this is much more focused on Bro. Um, but I'm going to go through a little bit of just kind of basic how we do, you know, um, incident response with Bro as kind of a simple level. And then we're going to go into kind of a lot more complex policies and frameworks and stuff that, that gets, gets into the weeds. So I think it's going to be a, a, an interesting talk. Um, what did you want to say about this, Ashish? This, so, yeah, this, this uh, basically, the ASCII art is actually an output of uh, irc.log of a Bro log. So, we just thought it was an interesting thing. Like, you can find Askai Art in Brolog as well. So. <laughs> so just really quickly, yes, we are uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. As you heard um, from Vern kind of about his background and, and, and research into Bro and, and networking and stuff that happened. But um, just a little bit about us to set the stage. You know, we're a uh, Department of Energy lab, but we're managed and operated by the University of California. So we're really much more like kind of a big university in many ways. Um, and we're basically completely unclassified and dedicated to solving, you know, the greatest science challenges of the world and, and bringing those things to market or to the people in, in a really direct way. So these are some of our kind of user facilities that people come and either use at the lab or services that we provide to the greater community. So that's just what we do. And we're just on the operational security team, so we just basically take care of all the security incidents. We run lots of bros. Um, and manage all the sort of security stuff that happens at the lab. So our network is very open, and we have you know about 10,000 people that visit every year. So part of the interesting part of working at the lab is, is running um, and operating security on a network that's so open. So we're definitely proud to be the birthplace of Bro. Um, we do have Bro logs on disk all the way from back when Vern was starting this, this project. Um, and those are sometimes used for interesting sorts of research. So it's kind of a, a neat aside. Um, we, we have this close co collaboration with the Bro team still. Um, Robin is kind of on our team, more or less, comes to a lot of our meetings. So we get that feedback between operational security and Bro research. And that's, um, as Vern described, what led to a lot of the success of Bro early on and continued success. And that's what we're going to kind of focus on in this talk, too, is just how operational security leads into what Bro can do and what it does for us, and, and vice versa, what Bro gives us in terms of operational security that makes our jobs possible and makes it easier. Um, so we do use Bro for everything. Of course, we have other tools also. And this first incident I'm actually going to talk about, we'll, I'll show you. This is started by um, you know a different alert than something with Bro. But we always end up going back to Bro. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but first things, this is not really related to the presentation, but we are very excited to be releasing this document, which is our technical paper about our 100 gig um, intrusion detection system that we built around Bro and um, an Arista set of devices. So we presented this at Bro for Pros, and we had been talking to a lot of people. We've had a lot of help from lots of people in the room to review this document, write it over many months. Uh, it kept getting pushed further and further out. But we are very happy to announce that this is now totally live and up, and anyone can go and download it. So the idea is this is not a research paper. This is just kind of a technical how-to of how we came to some of the design decisions about our system, um, the exact configurations and parts and everything we needed to build it, um, some of the performance metrics, and, and how it's running for us in, in the real world. So anyone that's been interested in or 
Um, talk to me about this. The paper is up now. Please go download it. Um, get in contact with us. Share your thoughts, questions, anything like that. So this is just kind of an aside, but we're, we're really happy to announce that we pushed to get it ready for, for BroCon, and, and it is out and available now. So how do we do IR with Bro? Um, we are kind of an old school team. We don't have a SIM, really, except for Gmail. Um, We've, we've messed around with a lot of different things over the years. We've, we've had Splunk, we've had uh, you know, the, the Elk stack, we've messed around with that, we've been looking at Spark, we've been looking at all this stuff, but ultimately our team often gets back to you know, this set of command line tools, GNU Parallel, because we find that it's often just the fastest. We've got a lot of old school tricks and scripts and stuff that, that help us do this. Um, and we pull all of our logs from most of our bros into like a central log repository and, we, and then we've got some high-powered crunching boxes to do that. So that's just how we operate and you know, like other people said, there's not necessarily right or wrong way to do this. This is the way that we often go back to and we're always interested in hearing more about what other people are doing and, and keeping on the forefront of looking at other ways to do this. But this is often how we end up looking at our logs and doing IR, so if you see all the, the con log snippets, that's because this is where we got to with our um, incident response. So, like I said, Bro is among the tools that detect incidents for us, but um, not, always, not always the tool that detects an incident, but is always the tool that helps solve them and, and put the nail in the coffin of whatever we decide was the final answer to something, right? So, if we didn't have the Bro logs and we didn't have the kind of capabilities of Bro across our entire network, deep inside and on the border and all the places that we've tried to instrument it, um, we would not be able to answer with clarity the sort of um, you know, incidents that we have and put them to bed. So Bro is absolutely fundamental in, in solving and um, closing incidents like that. So this was our kind of idea for the talk. We, we created this kind of waterfall of how we use Bro for incident response or, or even how someone who's, who's new to Bro would probably approach using Bro for instant response. So you'd start by just kind of using the stock Bro policy and logs. You drop it in, install it out of the box, and you're looking at you know these extremely rich logs that everyone knows and loves in this room, right? So the com log, the HTTP log, all the logs that you're familiar with. That's how you're going to start using Bro. Um, but after a while, maybe that's not enough. Maybe you find something that informs um, you know your um, your detection in such, the, such a way that you know you need to modify one of the policies. So maybe you just make a quick change to HTTP request or something in the IRC session. So we're going to kind of go through each one of these and talk a little bit about basically an incident that kind of changed that or made us realize that we needed to do a new policy or a new tweak to something or even develop a new analyzer or a new framework. So um, we'll kind of touch on each of these as we go, but just keep this in mind. This is, this is kind of the flow of how we were thinking about the presentation going. So this first incident starts with a FireEye alert, right? It wasn't Bro that, that tipped us off to this. It was the FireEye. Um, so <laughs> after the uh, presentation this morning and what I was going to talk about, we got a hit on a meterpreter from, from the FireEye. Never a good sign, definitely. Um, so if we're looking at this, if you're the incident responder on call, what's the first thing I'm going to do? Well, I'm going to go to the con logs. So, First thing we do is just go to the con logs and start looking at that IP that's um, you know, our attacker IP or where, where it appears the interpreter session is getting back to. So we go and look at it and sure enough, um, you know, we see a connection. I've, I've stripped down some of these con logs a little bit just to make it a little more readable, but um, you know, here's a connection, port 1099. Here's our, here's our connection, again, connecting outbound on port 8080. So yeah, we see connections. We kind of confirm with bro, yep, something weird is going on, definitely. The FireEye isn't lying to us, right? It, it appears to be a valid alert. Not sure what's going on yet, um, but this port 1099 appears interesting, right? So maybe we dug a little bit further into it and said, you know, huh, port 1099 is open, so that's that's notable. Um, like I said, in our environment, there's no firewall on the border, so if you know your uh, machine was in a specific configuration, 1099 could be open to the world. So. Mint 1099 was open to the world. There wasn't a host firewall. Maybe there's a service running on there that we should be caring about. So maybe going back and looking a little further, we see, huh, it looks like there's actually a scanner that scanned the whole lab for 1099 and, and found our victim, right? So we went back and looked at this, and it's like, you know, we've got scan detection, we've got blocking, we've got all sorts of, um, you know, stuff to stop this, but 
it appears that this scanner hit it really quickly and he found the open port and, and that's all he needed. So then the, the attacker has their first piece of info that they can start going at us. So it turns out port 1099, if anyone is familiar with this, is the Java RMI port and it basically allows you to upload or um, Java applications or bundles and stuff. Um, you know, it can be used for specific applications that do that, or it could just be some sort of stock um, Java app that was on there that was, um, you know, listening in, in default mode. So there's vulnerabilities with old versions, and if it's not closed off or protected in any way, it could just be listening on 1099. So there it is, available to be attacked. Um, we go back to the RMI upload, or back to the con log, sorry, and we see the actual, a separate IP address that's attacking and we see the 1099, we see actually some data that gets, that gets passed there. So we feel like we've, we've seen the compromise now in the con logs. And then right after that, in terms of our time, right, we see the Metasploit outbound from our host to this port 8080. So we're starting to get the sense, yep, we think we know what happened at least. We, we saw the scan, we saw the connection to 1099 and some sort of upload, and now we've got interpreter speaking outbound, right? It's a pretty straightforward incident, but Without the bro logs, we'd be lost, right? We, we, we'd be going back to PCAPs already at this point, or we'd be going to NetFlow and saying, you know, oh, we'd, we'd probably never have put together, you know, everything so quickly, obviously, is to have our, our, our precious con logs. So that's been great. What would be the next thing we would do? Well, we're still in stock bro land, right? But we'd just go over to our HTTP logs and say, what else is happening there, right? What about those uh, port 8080 connections? That, you know, appears to be an interpreter, but let's see what's going on there. So go into the HTTP logs and we can see the actual exploit getting pulled down. So there's, you know, maybe they uploaded a quick um, jar bundle that then, you know, pulled down the actual Metasploit exploit. So we're seeing that in the first, you know, these first um, downloads right here. And then we see when it actually, you know, pushes the interpreter shell back out from our internal host over to port 8080. So now we're getting a picture, yep, okay, 1099, it actually triggered a download of malware and that, you know, put the payload on there from the Metasploit and the payload was a interpreter and now it's got an outbound connection and the interpreter is established, right? So again, just stepping through one at a time, um, the, the sort of pieces of this incident, it's all pretty much making sense. So just a good example of kind of a, a straightforward way. So what did we do? Well, we just pulled out Metasploit ourselves and said, okay, well, let's put Metasploit on it and try a 1099. Yep, sure enough, you know, exploit comes right back. There we go, we got root on the box. So we're pretty much confirmed that we know what happened. Bro logs told us what we thought happened. We confirmed it with our own Metasploit. So, you know, pretty straightforward thing. And there's, there's not a surprise here. This is just, me, like I said, me walking through a pretty simple incident with Bro of using this with kind of stock logs, right? So a little bit more interesting was the fact that once Meterpreter got on here, one of the things they did is put a uh, IRC, sh you know, um, bot on there and connected back to their um, to their mothership. So we have uh, IRC logs or something that that uh, were was built into Bro 153, and Ashish actually is ported forward into the 2.0 for us. So this is something we really relied on, you know, back in the day when IRC bots were all the rage. We were just, you know, we just pull out um, attacks all the time using the IRC logs. It's a little less common these days, um, but we're we're still running these policies, and this is, you know, highly valuable to us. So you can actually see, you know, here's this limited log which just kind of has some you know, rough details of, yep, here's the connection, you know, there you can see the user logging in and where they're going and, you know, some basic stuff about it. And then a second, a second log, which would be called IRC detailed, actually has, you know, the full text of the connection. So similar to that first um, slide where we showed the actual ASCII art. So this is exactly what we're seeing from the IRC detailed log. So now we're getting a little insight into actually what the attackers are doing or what they're looking at or, or not what they're looking at, excuse me, but what the, what's happening in the IRC channel as the bot connects. Did you want to say something? I was just about to ask, how often does it occur nowadays, IRC stuff? The IRC stuff? I, every now and then. Every now and then, yeah, yeah. Maybe a couple times a year, I'd say. Um, 
So then here's an example. This is the unedited version for, for this crowd, but this is, uh, this is what actually came out of the IRC detail logs of this incident. So you see what happens is it connects, and uh, you know the guys are like, um, guys, look who just connected here, right? It's this LDL IP. And of course, they have no idea who we are, that we're totally unclassified, or that we don't hold all the nuclear secrets that they think we have. But you know, as soon as they connect, it's like, oh man, you, you better, I'm getting out of here. See you in Mexico. And you know, these guys are joking around with each other and just saying, you know, oh man, I, I don't know, this is scary. So um, it's, it just provides us no end to the amusement of what we get to, do, you know, pull this out of our bro log. Don't worry, you are, and we're coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> you would have caused a couple of guys to have a heart attack. Yeah. Well, they would disappear and never do this again. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> true. Um, but this is, like I said, straight out of this IRC log from Bro. We didn't go back to the PCAPs for this. We didn't have to do anything. So, right, just a little bit of extension of this simple IRC policy. And all of a sudden, not only did we have the whole trail, the incident, and how it got attacked, and that they started an interpreter, but now we know as soon as they connected to, you know, there's actual people here we're watching on the other end. And that just makes it super fascinating, right? Um, we, I was just going to touch on Time Machine a little bit because we do full packet capture with Time Machine. And so at some point, we went back to Time Machine to say, well, what was the Meterpreter actually doing, right? We got the IRC logs, but this was after someone using Meterpreter actually downloaded the IRC um, bot and started it running. So we went back to Time Machine, and you could actually see these three things things getting downloaded. So here's the commands they actually typed into Metasploit, right? So here's they're removing the history and stuff, but here they're downloading a chat client, clearing the history and stuff as you would normally see an attacker do, and then getting a rootkit also. So they download a rootkit in this case. Um, just worth saying that, you know, this is this is something beyond bro, but something that, you know, everyone's always using full PCAPs. And this was an example of where, you know, we had to go back to get full PCAPs, but um, as the gentleman said in his uh, thing this morning, right, there's now a, a meterpreter um, bro policy. So um, I guess I removed that. Okay, I removed that slide, but there's a meterpreter bro policy now. So now all we have to do is install a policy and maybe we get a notification that there was a meterpreter attack, right? So we might get an alert and maybe that would have tipped us off before the fire eye. Um, and, and my thought is always, well, we can just kind of do a meterpreter detail log, just like the IRC detail log, and we could have then all of this stuff in plain text in a meterpreter log. So if we saw an encrypted meterpreter sessions, we could actually just have that all detailed out too, and then we'd get all this stuff right into a bro log too. So just another cool thing that bro could do with just a little bit of um, configuration now. So, um, And then one final thing is, uh, in this case, the uh, the rookie was not successful. We actually, you know, as part of that whole interpreter log that we dumped out of full PCAP, you could see them trying to install it. I think they tried to compile it and it failed on the on the machine for whatever reason. Um, but we took the name of the of that rootkit, jsnow.tar.jz, and we put it into a sensitive URI policy in Bro, so that you know if these guys got on, tried to use the same um, name for this rootkit anywhere else, we're going to now get a message about it. So just a, a quick example of how we would take an indicator, feed it back into Bro so that they're not going to get us the second time around with at least this, this same named file. So that's the end of that incident. So, you know, um, again, just demonstrating how using the stock Bro logs and maybe a little bit of extension to, to really walk all the way through an incident and mostly having Bro give us really rich detailed information is just totally invaluable in, in IR. Um, so now a little bit deeper on this one. This was a, a recent phishing attack that we had at the lab. Um, so this one affected a lot of people at the lab and, and I'll kind of explain why. So it was a little, you know, we're all getting these phishing incidents all the time. A lot of them are just not notable, but this one was a little more notable for a few reasons and then um, we'll talk about why we didn't catch it. So this started out with someone at the lab getting an email message from their loan broker, right? This is someone outside of the lab, but they were communicating with their, with their lab email. They got this subject, important document, please see the attached file. It was just a clickable link. It did not actually have a PDF attached. It just went to this, to this malicious domain, which was just a phishing site, actually. It was not hosting malware. So. The guy was expecting something from his loan broker, so of course he went over to you know newfled.com and entered his username and password. So 
What did they do? The attackers quickly logged onto his Gmail account and sent out the same phishing message. Basically, just the only thing that got tweaked was now it's called labdocs.pdf instead of document a229tax.pdf. But same thing, subject important document. Now this goes out to hundreds of people at the lab and all, all, the, all the people in, this, in patient zero's con in contact list. Um, so this quickly spread and it's spread within the lab. So right, normally we're looking for something outside of the lab. This is coming in, it's easier to spot if it's some weird Gmail address or whatever, but now we've got a guy infected inside the site and he's sending out messages to all his contacts. And of course, um, just like he was expecting something from his loan broker, well, patient one was, you know, expecting a message from patient zero. Said, yeah, I, we had just been talking last week. You know, he said he was going to send me a document. Here it comes, important document. I clicked in, and it asked me to authenticate to Gmail. So, of course, I did that, and it just got worse from there, right? So the same sort of thing that spread so quickly, and it was, um, you know, within the community that that's what made it really hard, right? That, that trust that we've built up within the community to kind of trust people and know that things are okay was, was broken down quickly by this attack because, you know, people might have thought if they had received this message, well, you know, I know you guys, security guys told me, you know, I got to watch out for links that I'm not sure about and I didn't really know this guy and it was just kind of general important document, but when it's coming from, you know, the guy you're expecting a message from and you really want to get this done, you know, it creates a sense of urgency and it, and it ended up getting us pretty bad. So, you know, once this spread out, went to about 1,700 people, maybe 800 people within the lab, 900 external people. So we, you know, we're fighting this fire in the middle of all this and people are sending us the same message. You guys are spamming us and everything else. So the, the one notable kind of funny thing was this patient one had some relationship to this loan broker. So when she got infected and her credentials were also stolen from the site and the attackers logged in as her and sent out, right, continued this train here. But she sent a message back to the original guy who had started this whole thing. So that was kind of a funny turn of events there. So what would we do to, to stop this? Well, of course, we'd turn to Bro, right? We'd go to the SMTP log to get all sorts of information. We'd just start mining these logs. As soon as we found out about the incident, we're, we're in the SMTP logs looking for the subject, important document, looking for the people that we know they're infected at the lab, trying to harvest all the people that got the message, you know, the, the, the normal things you would do in an incident response kind of setting for, for a mail or phishing event. Um, so, more examples of what we did, right? Looked at the HTTP log to see who actually went to the new flood site and entered their credentials. We checked DNS to see who looked it up. We're looking for other similar messages and senders and attachments and the MD5s, you know, all of this stuff we're doing with bro logs, basically. Um, and looking for HTTP to see if there's any other malware. So that still doesn't get down to how we actually detected this. So Ashish, what, what alert detected this attack again? Uh Somebody called us that, hey, there is this <laughs> mail which I wasn't expecting. Is it real or is it something bad? So it was a human who detected this. So, and uh, the reason I pose this question uh, is because there was a failure. We did not detect it. And I think uh, it was last year or last to last year I talked extensively about SMTP analysis and all this uh, entire SMTP detection platform. So this is the current state of SMTP detection we are running. So we do attachment analysis, we do embedded URLs, invalid recipients, rejection codes, and then we have this known indicators where there is this feed of data which is coming in and we would actually try to use that. So there is this comprehensive, and each one of these components actually have multiple files and multiple policies which actually are. So I thought it was quite comprehensive, but we would still miss it. And so what and why would we miss something like this? So in attachment analysis, the limitations was that there are too many false positives. So even though, if you recall, the document was named uh, tags document 8299, it still had the same MD5 sum as lab docs. But then there are so many attachments which actually have same things, same MD5. So you can't rely, there's a lot more false positives. So we kind of like increase the threshold there. Uh, in embedded URLs, it's an incremental detection. Okay, you learn that this is malicious, you actually go improve the policy, and then next time there is some other maliciousness you do. So there is this thing. Uh, invalid recipients and SMTP rejects generally uh, detect a lot of spam, but not an activity like this. 
and then there is known indicator. In this case, important document is not a good known indicator. You will see that a lot in the subject. Likewise, there's like we didn't know about the sender or anomaly. So there was all these different limitations and failures. So what do you do? You write another new bro policy. It's called smtpthresholds.bro. And this policy was basically designed to look at this characteristics of this particular attack. So uh, what happened is as soon as uh, this per particular person got owned, he gave his credentials. I think it was less than four minutes, 30 seconds that attackers logged into his Gmail account. They actually had pre-built list of uh, uh, addresses uh, outside the lab as well as inside the lab. They used the address book. They sent out, I think, 19 emails with 100. Uh, no, sorry, the first one sent out about uh, 10 or 12 emails with 100 CC or BCC in there. So the characteristic was this thing, that in 32 seconds, there was 750 emails which actually went out. And likewise, uh, here, uh, uh, and the number of LBL recipients was 203. And then later on, see, the number of LBL recipients is 778. So as time progressed, the number of uh, recipients and the emails changed. So I think this one, the second one is actually uh, the patient uh, one, this, uh, this alert is for patients, you know. So we said, okay, let's see if we can actually figure out the SMTP threshold. How many emails is a particular person sending? How many of them are going to the lab users? How many are going to outside? What's the rate of the email? So this policy was pretty much uh, generating that. So this data is post-incident. So we went to Time Machine, got the PCAPs, ran PCAPs against the policy, and basically develop this particular policy. So how does this policy actually work? It's extremely straightforward. Uh, all the workers actually see the SMTP data because we divide all, the da uh, all of our uh, data stream into different uh, multiple work, uh, worker feeds. And then, uh, so each one of them actually sees this SMTP. So they actually um, take this SMTP thresholds and send that to manager. I finally figured out the Clusterization, so that's where I said, okay, let's feed everything to the manager. Manager has two data structures. One is SMTP activity, and then I figured out this another uh, uh, little uh, observation, which was uh, that often, uh, you know, miscreants can do like all this nasty stuff where they can create like multiple Gmail addresses or they can actually uh, change uh, attachment or links, but often they keep the subject same. So I wanted to see, okay, how many emails actually go which has the same constant subject. So I just created another uh, data structure. And you can see, I literally like just took this thing, copy, pasted, and added this. So, so just scale there. And then uh, to make it operational, I actually had to put a whitelist. And the whitelist uh, uh, digestion is done using input framework. So I don't want Bro to stop. I don't want others to actually go and modify the policy. So it was like, okay, let's just have a file, just keep up to, uh, appending to the file, and use input framework, take that data from the file, keep uh, feed it to bro. If there is a subject sender attachment or a string in that whitelist, don't generate an alert. Otherwise, if the counts are greater than the thresholds, look if it's an LBL sender, then we actually distinguish with like high number of recipients, sender, subject, or if there is a target subject. Otherwise, this is like bulk send. So you see a lot of stuff here is which is like New York Times uh, sending a bulk email. But what you see here is either big announcements that we have a pizza party today evening, or hopefully we can catch something like this. So this, I, I wanted to like show people some bro code as well. So here, this is basically the meat of the policy. Uh, these were different notice types. This is the core data structure. So I, I record like time, start time, uh, of very, very first time the email is sent, then I keep end time, and then I just keep incrementing the end time so that we can figure out the delta and how long did it take. Then I said, okay, let's create a set for uh, from and to, and then all of a sudden, like, okay, so if a mail goes to 4,000 people, there is 4,000 entries in the set. Uh, now you have a mil 1 million emails in a day. You have these many sets, so can it scale? I said, let's see, so it actually scaled up. And it didn't crash, bro, but it actually runs in an operational setting. So I started just populating every email you get. Uh, the, uh, basically, the index is mail from, and then I just populate all these data structures. And this becomes the core table, uh, table string. So this string is actually mail from, and then off SMTP thresholds, which actually just is. And, uh, so, and then here are our thresholds. So like, OK, I am waiting when we actually get alerted on the 100,000 or a million emails. 
So, so uh, just an insight on this policy as well. So it was about 500 lines of code, and that includes white spaces and blank lines too. And, and what I had to do was that everything was actually cooked for me. Everything was already in log SMTP event. So I just went into log SMTP event, and I said, OK, I'm going to parse mail from uh, reply to uh, and all these th things from the log. Just take it, feed it into the table. And then uh, there is this little code for clusterization. And it actually is pretty straightforward. It's pretty mechanical code. There was some other code written for whitelisting, which actually means OK, here is this input file. Take that input file, uh, feed it into a table, and then cross-check against that table. And then uh, Seth gave me this uh, script, which actually decodes encoded subject and all those things. So they, I just actually did all this little thing. So this, uh, this basically was the new detection so that we can actually figure out if there are thresholds which are crossing. But is it done? Uh, is it a final solution for finding SMTP incidents? No, I am sure we will be writing new and other different detections for SMTP analysis. So, <laughs> yes, actually, in fact, yeah. And uh, I, I feel, in fact, I actually got a, a clarification to where somebody actually, so Bro generates this alert, and then there is, our users are trained to inquire with us if they are not sure. So one user actually said, uh, uh, is this for real that I got invited for this party? I'm like, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so, yeah, true story. <laughs> so, uh, so here is another incident. This is Shellshock. So this, uh, like, everybody is familiar with Shellshock. The best thing here was we did not write a policy. We actually got policy from the community. I think bro mailing list was pretty active. Somebody sent, wrote a policy. Seth actually put a policy. I took the policy. I ran it, and we were covered. And it was a pretty decent policy. So, but uh, I just wanted to show in detail, like, okay, how we had to extend this policy further down. So here, th this is a pretty. A dense slide, but I just like this slide somehow. <laughs> so what happened here is I'll explain the incident. So there was this bad scanner which came in. It actually ran a nasty scan, and it connected to five LBNL hosts. And why five? Because it actually got blocked by then. So and turns out that uh, our victim scan system was actually the very first system on the list. Now. Uh, there are two possibilities. And uh, one is that attacker was very sophisticated. They knew that this is a vulnerable machine, and that is the very first machine they connected to. I discard this possibility. The second, <laughs> uh, the second possibility is law of probability. When there is millions and millions of scan going on, there is like thousands of machine, there is bound to be a, some probabilistic value where attacker might get lucky, and that's what I think happened here. They got this machine. and. ones that didn't manage to get lucky got blocked and you got nothing. And so if, if there's a whole sea of activity, you'll see just the juicy one. And I, I've had this also going through logs from like, how unlikely is that? And it's due to that effect. Yeah. So, so here, uh, this victim system. So what happened on this system was that uh, uh, attacker actually ran this HT, some HTTP uh, re request to exploit shell shock. And what Bro did here was actually generated three alerts. There was this suspicious client header, HTTP header attack, and the address got actually dropped in less than 200 milliseconds. So this all happened. Bro actually did that. And this is real log data. Now, what did not happen was that this particular malicious activity actually had a curl request embedded into it. And the curl request went to like this whirlpool express.co.uk. Uh, so Bro did not generate any alert for the curl re request or for bot.txt or any subsequent activity. So how did we catch this incident? We caught this incident because of a syslog alert where we actually flag any activity where there is UID equals to root, uh, equals to zero, and root. So we actually caught it this way. But uh, just to get into more details, like this is Bro log. So we see that, OK, this is what exactly the attacker actually did. And uh, so. Here is the next step. Here is actually address getting dropped. So actually, Dob sent me an email. Question for you, Dob. Are you using Bro to look for that syslog? So this particular alert actually was SEC. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I am using Bro to actually look at syslog too. So so Dob sends me an email and says, hey, here is this thing going on and. 
like, uh, do you have a PCAP? Yes, I have a PCAP. And then there was this back and forth email with Dom, and then we came with further detection. So now we had this script, it ran very well, we blocked a malicious scanner, and everything seemed to be good. That was what we were doing for a while. But still, this IP got owned. So if we are blocking the uh, scanner at very moment, why would this IP get owned? So even though we blocked it, this request got successful, the victim IP actually ran this code and just pretty much uh, went further down. So we had two conditions here. One was this strong belief that, you know, if we can block a vic uh, attacker IP, we are okay. So this reminded me of a, like, 1998, 99 uh, incident where you know you can inject a plus in our host and then this one single command can actually own a computer. So this was pretty much similar to that. So yeah, blocking an IP is not quite always an ultimate protection. This is a rare phenomena, but it does happen. And second one was, I thought we blocked the IP, but we had a compromised machine on the network. So uh, this policy was good, but it was not good enough. So here we went into like more detailed analysis of the attack. So let me just quickly walk you through the attack. It's like scan for vulnerable system, find vulnerable system, run this exploit, which is literally like w get a URL, and then download malware, and then do a misuse of the machine. So what actually worked here was we blocked it. Uh, we actually saw this, and we blocked it here. We recorded activity here where there was all this wget happening. And then we actually saw the misuse activity. And this is where we generated the alert. But what we missed is this vulnerable system detection or the malware download. So even though we logged it, did we know that bot.txt is a bad string? We generally, now I know, so I can go and update the HTTP request uh, dot bro, but that moment of time, I did not know it. So there's this big hole here, and there is a hole here. So the big questions, and actually, I think I propose these both questions to the greater community. Like, can we have a mechanism where we can actually identify if a system is vulnerable based on the scanner activity? So somebody runs an Nmap. They actually, uh, on their screen, they would see this Nmap output. And you can actually see that this activity happened. So uh, it would be awesome if actually on my screen we see that this scanner actually ran and mapped, and these are the machines which were vulnerable, and this is what scanner sees on his desktop. Y yes? Uh, it's entirely possible that you have to know what the return the scanner is looking for. So if you're talking about Qualys, Nessus, and map stuff like that, you could map that. That work can be done. But if you have a custom scanner, coming from a third party or other like foreign agency, you don't know what they're expecting or if they're expecting nothing. And so that leaves uh, part of it yes, part of it no. Right, and as of today, like the entire thing is we don't, don't have anything existing. So even if we can do that for like known scanners or whatever people can publicly download and run, it would be a good start, I think so. And would it be useful? I think it would be useful, but we'll figure it out in time. And then second is like, uh, can Bro detect all the state transitions? So the failure in this policy was this state transition detection was not completely done. Like we would detect that this is the signature for uh, shellshock exploit, but we did not care about when the download happens and when the download actually is malicious and gets installed. So can we actually expand the policy further down? So here, uh, uh, yes, we did expand the policy further down, and we actually added four additional uh, alerts here. So one was that we can actually figure out the attempt, and this, is, this was done by the stock policy, which was uh, community supplied. Then it was like, okay, how about we say that uh, we already have this data too, like this uh, malicious URL, whirlpoolexpress.co.uk, uh, when there was a w get done, it has to be resolved. There has to be a DNS request. So if the URL is actually in a shell shock request, you extract this URL out and look for any DNS request for that uh, domain. If there, after DNS request, if w get is successful, then you will actually see a HTTP get request too. So if this uh, domain has a HTTP request, then you actually come with that. And if that's successful, you actually call it a shell shock. So now it actually becomes a lot more uh, like comprehensive detection. So here, this was the original code, like HTTP header, if this matches, generate this attempt. But then here is this simple thing where you actually created this table 
the domain is this malicious domain embedded in there, and then you just keep populating this table, and then it starts checking uh, through other events. So the first event you check is DNS request. The other event you check is HTTP message done. And in case if all these things match together, you actually generate this uh, shell shock compromise. So it's kind of like expanding the policy further down so that you can actually see all the state transitions of this particular attack. But uh, there is one more hidden thing I did not think about, and then I was like happy. This is Intel framework. You can just directly say insert. So now you are actually inserting this domain directly into Intel framework on fly. So like generally the concept with Intel framework is you have a feed, you take the feed, you actually give it to Intel framework, but you can actually take bro, like bro can identify badness, you can use just this simple command and you can actually feed it into Intel framework. Of course, when you restart bro, it might not exist anymore, but it might be in your log. So yeah, you can actually do this detection in fly too. So uh, going back to the next slide, these are actually these three different uh, Policy. So I actually just combined these three different incidents into one single uh, topic. So here what we did is, uh, okay, uh, we had NTP incident, we had RDP, we had SIPs incident. And, and 2.4 actually has RDP and SIP analyzers, and both are really, really good. So we actually got complaint, and you know this, you love working at lab because you get emails with this subject. So. I mean, uh, you have to laugh after uh, reading the subject and then you go in. So somebody would complain that their printer is actually just printing spewing papers every night or every other night. And then they would complain again. And after a while, they actually say this printer strikes again. And what happened here is if you look, the printer actually printed out SIP NM2, NM2. And I'm like, huh, this seems to be something SIP related. Let's go to the SIP log. <laughs> so, and oh, I, I just upgraded to 2.4, so I should have SIP analyzer as well. So uh, here, this was a DOS attack which happened because of the NTP monolith. So actually, uh, how an internet phenomena is uh, uh, big, uh, we know it by two ways. Either it hit us, and then it gets into news, or it gets in new, into news, and before you read the news, it, it hits us. So NTP was in news, and it's all of a sudden, we had a machine which was participating in the DOS. So here, uh, I just made this table to show that new analyzers, how much they can help you. So uh, NTP analyzer was existing, but there was a new policy, and Scott actually sent me this policy for NTP analyzer uh, detection as soon as this came out. Uh, RDP was a new analyzer, and then uh, we wrote a new policy for it. Same for SIP scanning. And the purpose was to block pawn list queries here, brute force attack, uh, mostly morto and then some scanner activity, and then all this SIP vicious scan. So I actually went to logs to see how much are we blocking. So before we uh, ran these analyzers, these, these are the uh, number of unique IPs which we did not block in a week. So we are approximately blocking these 1,000 IP addresses in a week based on these three policies. And uh, it was interesting to see the false positives too. So there was this one single false positive in NTP, and you know that was actually, and so we inquired further, it was an ESNet machine IP, which was actually part of a honeypot which Vern's group is running. So I never investigated it further after that. But uh, others, we really, really don't have any false positives on our uh, RDP or SIP scanner. And it was pretty quick to run this. So there was these four new notices which actually got into the picture. So just to show, Again, some inside code, okay, well, how is this policy? So SIP vicious actually is very helpful. It actually says your friendly scanner as a user agent. So I said, okay, if user agent is friendly scanner uh, and it's part of from to user agent and like malicious SIP is in value, so friendly scanner in value, call it SIP vicious scan and then block it. So it was, as, I mean, it was straightforward. So it's like slightly different that there is a policy, but policy is pretty logical here. So just note that we actually had uh, block codes of 403 and 401 and forbidden unauthorized, and that actually is the second policy. So if uh, a scanner is scanning and your SIP server keeps replying forbidden, 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 I actually look at certain thresholds, and then I generate this alert and I block them. Uh, nobody has complained so far, and this has been pretty effective too. So uh, NTP control, it was even more straightforward. There was this, okay, if it maps, uh, the code is in NTP private or NTP control. You actually look at if you have already blocked this IP. If not, you go ahead and you block. So there was these three policies pretty very, very 
very small, very comprehensive, but quite effective overall. Uh, and oh, so this is the RDP blocking. So in RDP blocking, uh, what I noticed in RDP log, and I, I, I like RDP analyzer because it actually solves a lot more problems than I actually anticipated it would solve. So one thing uh, the log shows is that there are these, these single alphabet usernames which actually are like fail, 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 or successful. And these are all motto activity. So I just said, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say all the usernames from A through Z, small and caps, and see if these users actually exist in RDP connection requests. If they do, call them brute force scan and then block them. And this is primarily motto activity. I don't know why it uses A, B, C, or D, but it actually uses this single uh, alphabet uh, uh, usernames. So, so this basically, now actually I wanted to show this thing. Now, this is pretty much uh, work in progress and very dev. I, I think neither Robin or Seth has seen it, but you might have heard about it. I wanted to actually throw this idea to the group and hopefully in next BroCon we actually have this authentication framework. So, uh, so why uh, I wanted to make case for authentication framework. It is important. So uh, uh, this actually, this particular set of slides actually covers one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven incidents. So uh, instead of going into like stories of the incident, I thought, okay, let's just summarize them. So was there a compromised account using SSH? Yes, we had that. Google Auth, we had it. LDAP, RDP, VNC. Now VPN and WinLog, we don't know. Why? Because there is no analyzer right now, so, so we just need to figure out. But is there a possibility that there was a VPN account compromise? Very high possibilities. So what is the current state of detection? Like uh, for SSH, we do rely on instrumented SSH, but the deal is we don't run instrumented SSH on all the machines which are running SSH at the lab. We run it at selected few machines. And then we have this ad hoc uh, foreign login report, and it's actually so uh, ad hoc that we really don't know how to actually even formalize it properly. So, and then Google Auth compromise, Google accounts compromise, actually notifications from Google. We have external notifications here. We have users reporting. So there are accounts getting compromised, but there is no specific detection. So actually, I said, okay, let's see what are the ways user account gets compromised to. So there is this brute force attack there. Then there is this clear text where you actually literally send your credentials in clear. Most of the time it is HTTP, uh, but there are other protocols. Now IMAP and POP rarely are seen on the network, but there is clear text data. Then there is misconfigurations where people would actually uh, either use default user names like user, user, root, root, test, test, and that actually gets compromised too. And then there is this all credential stealing, which is actually more involving. You need uh, local root escalation and uh, exploit. You need other uh, uh, vectors into the attack, but there is credential stealing. And then there is this insider impersonation, uh, uh, which actually becomes even much more tricky. So the bar get, gets, uh, uh, keeps getting higher and higher in this particular line of attack. So what are the protocols? I just wrote whatever came to my mind, but it gets you an idea that this actually falls beyond the boundary of singular protocol. It can actually affect multiple protocols. So what is the desired response here? So we just want to block brute force in real time. We want to alert on clear text. We want to actually isolate uh, this machine and talk to the user that you know you have misconfigured. But then in terms of visibility, we really don't have much visibility in uh, actually uh, misconfiguration or like credential stealing, except for like instrumented SSH, which actually gives us good, but it's limited visibility. And then in insider impersonation attack, so actually, uh, I should talk, tell you guys about this uh, uh, hacker which was just determined to manipulate bro. Uh, that was an interesting event. So, oh, never mind. Uh, uh, so here is this uh, block diagram of how authentication framework works. So we use raw logs from syslog, uh, SSH, LDAP, VNC, VPN. So all these, these are actually syslogs. So these logs actually are fed using input framework into this particular policy. And this policy is pretty good in the sense that it actually understands if that log actually got rotated or it actually is not sending data. It looks at the rate of the incoming data and it, it starts and stops the reader if the file changes. So it actually is much more foolproof. So we actually get data from here. Then bro analyzers provide data from 
within Bro itself. So there's this MySQL analyzer, Kerberos radius analyzer. They have user information too. So we take all this data and then send it to this particular uh, uh, function called raw data. It normalizes the data. It does all this housekeeping of timestamp formatting. Uh, because remember, the syslog times are actually uh, month, day, uh, but uh, bro timestamps are in Unix time format. So it actually does all those things. It populates the data. And this particular thing is just so that it's clusterized. So this version of authentication framework is clusterized. It actually works pretty well in the set. And then it just dumps and creates this uh, auth data. So this data actually is all this data from here and here combined together. And then I started writing these different modules on top of it. So like, can we do GeoIP monitoring? Like if somebody is logging from Nigeria, we should know about it. But now we can know about somebody logging from Nigeria across protocol boundaries. We can know if it's for RDP, SSH, Google Auth, or any other uh, protocol. So then stepping stones. And so the ones in the dotted box are the, uh, the modules which are only here. There's nothing on the desk. So, but we started like expanding this, and I think it would just keep going on, growing and growing and growing. So here is what happened here. So Seth, I really like the, your, uh, where is Seth? He's not here. His classification about the log, uh, uh, for, uh, your log talk. So I actually went and modified my slide. So there's this parsed log, and the parsed log is literally the syslog, which actually got formatted, is, got parsed and formatted into uh, uh, in, in a way which actually is useful for me to digest into Bro. So you have timestamps, which is Unix time, sorry, human time. Then there, what is the source, what is the IP addresses, and so on and so forth. And then there is this interpreted layer. And the interpreted layer is literally like this data gets into Bro uh, and then gets manipulated. And then there is this hacker which is bent upon modifying bro every time. He logs in at 7 o'clock in the morning. He thinks we are sleeping, but no, we were awake. <laughs> so this hacker actually goes in, and then he thinks that he would log in as R Summer. So he logs in as R Summer. Later on, he becomes Robin. So Seth, as you said, we actually went into the actual useful result. So what this analyzer does, it actually gives you this stepping stone where this IP where R Summer logs in to this IP, and then he becomes Robin, and then goes further and logs into two other machines. So uh, yeah, in reality, the code does not know if this is same person. But so it can actually uh, be somebody else, and code cannot tell you that this is one person. This is I can interpret it. But what it can do is that if there is in certain duration time, different users are logging in and jumping from machine to machine, it starts just logging all that. So this is one module. Uh, we actually started like working on various different modules, but it actually kind of gives you an idea about this sort of thing. So one, uh, another useful information is like this. This is this sample from the auth log, where Vince actually logged in after he got here. So this is uh, the login which will happen. I logged in. And then when I logged in, I actually logged in as my Google Auth and as my SSH. So let's say if uh, uh, what happens in this case, I did not put rest of the data, but what happens in this case, if let's say 20 users are logging onto this particular machine, then this list keeps building up. So this machine gets compromised uh, uh, some, in some point of time. If we have to go and answer this question, how many users had account on this machine? So instead of finding administrator who barely has an idea about how many users, you can go here and you can just find this big list of users. Then you can take that list and go through this log again. And then you can pretty much construct this entire web of trust, like which users had account on what machine. And if that got rooted, how many other users would get affected? So it's kind of a, a useful collection of the data for further investigation. So this actually, uh, I'm not sure if you can read it, but I just uh, gave a sample of the authentication log data here, and I modified it. I actually went and edited the username. So you can see like all FFF, PPP. So, but the deal is this authentication data work across this so many. Uh, currently, it, you can see SSH, VPN, VNC, Google Auth, RDP. So we have uh, visibility across various authentication uh, uh, mechanisms currently. So what is it doing? It's consolidating authentications across various sources, correlating, and but there are so many further poly, uh, possibilities. So uh, I mean, if authentication framework is done next year, 
And if I am saying, uh, the reason I am saying it, whatever code I wrote generally only runs at one machine. Whatever code Robin, Seth, and Bro guys write, it runs everywhere. So you have to write this. <laughs> Yes, that's another possible. So there are multiple things you can do. And I think it would be very useful because often we struggle trying to figure out what user actually owns what machine. And I think this log would really help so that if they get owned, we can actually contact them real time rather than block them and wait for them to contact us. So, uh, oh, by the way, uh, uh, if you don't realize this was a false positive, so. <laughs> so, uh, to <laughs> so to summarize this talk, actually, like, uh, so we wanted to get in depth on, about incidents, like how do we use Bro to actually do incident response? But then we figured out, like, how we should showcase how Bro actually is helping in incident response, and how we are going back to Bro. So there's this cyclic. Uh, connection here, like Bro influences everyday operation for us, and then we try to influence Bro because of our experiences with everyday operation. And then uh, uh, the way we work is like when, uh, whenever we have an incident, we would actually comprehensively and exhaustively uh, go through that incident to understand what happened, what failed, what was successful, how can we catch it. So it might be okay, generally no, and it might be okay that you missed the incident the first time, but it, it's not acceptable that you miss the same incident the second time. So this, this circle where you learn from an event and then you actually modify your detections so that it works better next time. So we just wanted to highlight and show that uh, this particular thing. Now feel free to actually stop me and if uh, you have any further questions or anything. And at the same time, I would love to hear your like war stories or how you actually responded to incident and caught something because it always is useful. And I think another thing which I always think is like people always worry, oh, we got owned and it, we won't be talking about it. But I think it's the other way. Like it, it's always useful to know how somebody or some machine got owned because when you learn it, you just improve the detection. So it's always useful conversation to do. So uh, if you have any other questions or anything, you can actually send an email to security, stop me, Vince, or anybody you know and ask us. So. So Google is uh, basically primarily uh, the ecosystem lab uses for everything, in, which includes email, calendar, documents, drive. Google yeah, so Google Apps. Well, so we, we have Shibble single sign-on. So for all the web stuff, we have Shibble with logs, but we also synchronize passwords to Google for offline access. So we, we have logs through Google as well. So we're actually combining all of yeah. that together. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. So it looked like earlier in your talk you were actually using the SMTP analyzer and seeing mail sent out, but you're just using Google Mail. Gmail. Oh, yeah. So it's a oh. little uh, difficult uh, tapping, and that's why I asked Vince to do it. But let me just show you the diagram. It's it's an interesting <laughs> diagram. So it's not hundred percent accurate. but it actually gives you a very good idea. So we rely on iron port. And uh, so basically all the tap is in front of the iron ports and then iron port actually talks with Gmail. So the policy is that all the emails coming to the lab goes through the iron port to. Uh, so if, there, if, no. if it goes Gmail user to Gmail user, we miss it. Otherwise, our MXs are pointed at the iron port, so all mail flows through us, and we get to tap it. And yeah. then uh, I think uh, previous broke on somebody asked me this question, and I did not know the answer. But the way we actually make our uh, like uh, uh, what happens to the TLS? So lab actually says that we don't want to do TLS. So we say no TLS, and then we accept the mail. But if somebody emphasizes that no, we will be using TLS, then uh, actually we connect to them on TLS. Otherwise, we reject TLS, and we just want clear text emails. So, so yeah, yeah, there is this little thing where Gmail to Gmail uh, visibility is difficult, but uh, rest of them is pretty clear.
Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. So.